Okay, um, I think it's time to get started with the afternoon section, which is of course going to be very interesting. Our first speaker is Seth Lloyd, and he's gonna talk about universal deep quantum learning. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, it should be interesting to see if I can actually give a talk with real slides. That's, I think, perhaps the only interesting thing about this. Um, I apologize for not giving the organizers a title um, before the uh, workshop. I actually was debating for quite some time, and really until the, the, uh, the day before yesterday, about what to talk about. And I decided to, um, whether to talk about kind of more nitty-gritty aspects of adiabatic quantum computing and quantum annealing, or whether to talk about something more general, and I decided to talk about something more general. So I'm going to talk about universal deep quantum learning. And actually, I'm quite glad this didn't appear in the program because, I mean, if the, the, there's a title called Universal Deep Quantum Learning, then people might think a lot of stuff is going to go on. I mean, so, so you know, a few years ago when I started working on quantum machine learning, I found out about deep learning. And at first I said, wow, deep learning, that's amazing. Like machine learning is going to, computers are going to tell us about life and love and truth and happiness and all that stuff. And, but then I found out it just meant, you know, they're like these neural net-like structures with many layers, so they're deep. So that was kind of disappointing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then I began working on deep quantum learning, which already, that already sounds like really fine, like quantum versions of these things with many layers, and that sounds cooler still. And now, now I'm going to tell you about universal deep quantum learning, which sounds like so amazing that you won't be surprised to find out that nothing really comes of it. Actually, no, that, that's not true. That's not true, actually. Um, so, uh, uh, so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to consider quantum architectures for deep learning devices, including adiabatic and ground state Hamiltonian deep learning devices that are capable of universal quantum computation. Um, that is to say, these are, are systems with programmable Hamiltonians such that either in a dynamic form or in an adiabatic or ground state form, they can perform universal quantum computation. Um, uh, that is, this is actually, of course, different from the D-Wave device, which is a quantum device that you can use as a deep quantum learning device. And I actually saw many lovely papers about quantum Boltzmann machines out there in the poster session. Um, uh, such devices are capable of universal classical computation, but not universal quantum computation, so far as anybody knows, and there's lots of evidence that they can, right? Um, but okay, if, if you have a quantum architecture that's capable of, why should we look at this? If this architecture is capable of universal quantum computation, it means that this architecture, whatever it is, and I'm gonna discuss architectures uh, in just a second, it means that such quantum architectures can produce patterns that cannot be produced by classical computers. Um, they can exhibit, um, they can, uh, first of all, they can do things like, you know, Shor's algorithm. They can create things that are, um, that have all kinds of funky quantum correlations. Even with very shallow quantum circuits, one can exhibit uh, what's known as quantum supremacy, um, a term that I hate. Uh, because let's face it, supremacy is about hatred. So. Uh, <laughs> hence, that's why it's popular, right? So, uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I'm going to talk about nonetheless, even though it would be less popular if it were called something like quantum transcendence, which I think would be a slightly more positive term. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I am going to talk about it uh, later on. Um, so now the question that I'm going to raise in this um, Spanish format here. Uh, is can such devices also recognize and classify patterns that can't be recognized or classified by classical computers? And this is a very natural question in the context of machine learning, particularly deep learning architectures. Deep learning architectures, as people who work on them, like Hartmut here, um, the classical architectures, they have the feature that Frequently, they're capable of being operated in recognition mode where they're supposed to recognize patterns, but they're also capable of operating in generative mode where they, they kind of hallucinate patterns that they think are like the patterns that they're supposed to recognize. So the class of patterns that they can uh, recognize, generate and that they can recognize have a very significant overlap. 
So the argument, and this is a very simple argument, right? Very general, I mean, but by no means precise, is that if we have a device that can generate patterns that can't be generated classically, we can reasonably hope that such a device might be able to recognize patterns that we can't recognize classically. So I'm raising this as a question, and just to give away the answer, I'll show that such universal deep quantum learners can, if you're given quantum data, so if you're given quantum states and you want to learn things about quantum states, they can indeed do all kinds of interesting things. And I, actually, I'll sketch proofs. I've gone around and digging up in the, through the literature on control theory and optimization theory and classical deep learning. Interestingly, you can actually prove that they can do this and that they can actually find such patterns via gradient descent, as it turns out. Sorry. Shall I unplug it and plug it back in? I don't know what happened here. You, you work on that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, but um, uh, the real question is, um, I would call it the $64,000 question, but $64,000 doesn't buy what it used to, is given classical data, can quantum computers to keep things capable of deep quantum learning, universal deep quantum learning, can they recognize patterns that you can't recognize classically? And there, um, I'll present evidence about things, we'll discuss it in the context of quantum supremacy, but there the answer is we don't know. We don't know. And if we could show that that was indeed true, thank you very much, uh, then we'd be in very good shape. So let me actually, before, um, uh, uh, before no doubt, say, which I shouldn't say that I wasn't going to be using this for a second. So let me actually just say what I mean by um, universal deep learning in the classical context. So classical, thank you, universal deep learning. So um, uh, a, a common, a common, uh, I, I could actually, I, I've learned from past experience never to draw too many of these units. Okay. So a, a common classical universal deep learning architecture is a Boltzmann machine. So I'm drawing here a stacked restricted Boltzmann machine. So this is why I've got to be careful about this. Make too many of these, of these things because it all very fast. So each, each line like this is... Yeah, oh, sorry, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, just for the, yes, for the folks on out there, out there in, um, in electronic land, my apologies. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> people could hear me, right, without the microphone before, right? <laughs> I may not be John Dowling, but I can still project. So um, uh, a, a term like this is, corresponds to something like uh, if this is uh, I and this is J. Um, this is in a quantum context, or an, I, I can just write this as an icing model. So um, this has an, it corresponds to an energy functional. I know this, I'm saying classical, but of course, you know what I mean. So <laughs> sum over Ij, uh, omega I, uh, Zi plus gamma Ij, Zi, Zj. So these just correspond to icing terms. Um, uh, this is a stacked, restricted Boltzmann machine. Um, a Boltzmann machine would, in general, correspond to just having an icing model. And um, we have, uh, our, this is our Hamiltonian. And the idea is that you try to construct a Boltzmann distribution that matches the statistics of your data. Um, and in these stacked, restricted Boltzmann machines, the connectivity as I've drawn it here, everything at each layer is connected to everything at the layer above it and the layer, layer below it. And it's very easy actually to show, and it's a fun exercise to show, that you can by tuning those omegas i and omega and gamma j, that you can actually get this thing to do things like, uh, you can draw any circuit that you want into this. So for instance, I can get this so that I get that this is the and of this, and this is the knot of this, and this is just that. And then this right here is the or of these two things right here. And you know, this is, this is a, a uh, 
This is it. This actually doesn't get, well, let's, we'll do it like this, and this is a fan out gate. You can very easily tune these couplings and these individual terms in order to write a universal circuit, any logic circuit that you want. So when I say that the, the Boltzmann, the stack restricted Boltzmann architecture is universal, it means that it can perform universal computation. All right? Is, is this clear how this, how this works? It's a fun exercise to figure out what these couplings are supposed to be in order to make this, make this happen. So I leave it to you if you want to play around with it. Um, <clears throat> um, so this is actually very important, right? Because uh, for Boltzmann machines and cl other classical learning devices, if it's not computationally universal, then you don't expect it to be able even to reproduce very simple kinds of algorithmic relations between inputs and outputs. So for example, if I had, were able to make a circuit but only, the only relationships here were linear, so I could not do ors and ands but only, only things like exclusive ors, then I wouldn't expect this to be able, it's not classically computationally universal, can't compute its way out of a paper bag, and I would find, think it very unlikely for it to be able to actually recognize complicated patterns. Though there actually are interesting situations where you can look at systems that are linear and find out what they can. If it's trying to learn a linear input-output relationship, then maybe it can do that. Okay, but, but, but classically, one of the reasons that these devices work, that these deep learning networks work, is that they are universal. And this, by the way, is also true if I had, you know, if these were artificial neurons with activation levels and things like that, they are also computationally universal and you can construct any circuit from them. And it seems to me, I don't know if there's any controversy about this, but it seems to me that this is important for these devices to be able to do what they do. What do you think, Hartmut? Do you think so? Yes. Sure. Okay, good. But there we go. From the horse's mouth. Okay. So, <clears throat> all right. So, so that's what I mean by uh, 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 universal. And so now let's actually look in the context of quantum computers, how this works, and maybe we could... Uh, Lower the lights again so people can see. The yeah. The, oil, the inputs at the top and the outputs at the bottom. So, so you said what you hope is that you fix the qubit, the bits at the top. Yeah. You fix the bits at the top and then yeah. you cool it down and the bits at the bottom have the answer. Yeah. Is that the idea? Yeah, it's like this. Right, exactly. And why is there an H bar in your H? Oh, oh uh, uh, because I just I made it a, a quantum icing model. Oh, good. That's quantum. <laughs> but you, you know what? As, I think, as I said before, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> So, I mean, you know, if you actually, in the case of, 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 of quantum annealing, then you actually also have the sum over J. I have some gamma of T, I have X of J. This would be the transverse icing model. And, you know, we're all very familiar with that. And we've seen many, I saw many, many posters about that. And people like Mohammed and the folks at D-Wave spend a lot of time. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm very happy to see that, Mohammed, that your work on well, this was very inspiring, has inspired a lot of people here in Japan to go and work on this. I think there's a really interesting set of, of, of ideas, and there's a lot of great things out in that poster session out there. Um, yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, you try to set this up so that rather than being a thermal state, you have a particular value of the, the transverse field, and you see if you can't get the statistics to reproduce what you want. And that's a very interesting question. And there's a lot of open questions about that, whether you can learn things better this way. But this is not a, uh, a quantum computationally universal Hamiltonian. If you want to look at quantum computationally universal Hamiltonians, now could perhaps we have the uh, lights, lights down, please? Um, yeah. So um, uh, uh, we have, I mean, there are a lot of different models or things. I mean, so here, the, of course, uh, universal architectures include um, the gate model, where these are controlled knots. These are individual qubit rotations. We have a psi that goes in, and we have a u psi that goes out. Thank you. Um, uh, a, an interesting model is a gate model with arbitrary, arbitrarily large fan out. So we have a control, and there are many, many, many knots that come from that. Um, this, by the way, is the kind of quantum circuit model version of having something at this layer be connected to everything at this next layer. And these, these give us classes like AC and NC. And because I'm the founding member of the IHA, the I Hate Acronym Society, I don't know what these stand for. But uh, <laughs> they, stand for, they stand for circuits, often shallow circuits, with arbitrarily large fan out. That I know. 
um, a particularly interesting model um, for Hamiltonian models of, of quantum computation. And these are ones that could be either dynamic models of Hamiltonian computation or adiabatic, in which you encode the answer in the ground state. Well, there's the uh, Feynman Hamiltonian, where you have a basically a particle or a clock variable that's hopping along a line. And uh, when it hops forward by one, it performs the ELF quantum logic operation. And um, uh, uh, actually, I, I think I was the first person to point this out uh, back in something like 1993, that the ground state of this encodes the whole computation. Um, it's actually kind of fun. It's the, it was in the context of the Wheeler-DeWitt model of the uh, Wheeler-DeWitt equation. But let's not talk about quantum gravity right now. So, uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, Kataya famously used this to, to uh, uh, formulate the theory of QMA completeness around 2000 or so. Um, now, uh, uh, Barbara Terhall and I, a couple of years ago, showed that if you have a, um, a bunch of qubits on a lattice like this, and um, these kinds of red kinds of things are uh, icing-like interactions. These kinds of little dotted lines are xy interactions, or they could also just be xx interactions. Um, uh, uh, then, uh, well, let's say xy interactions for our, our purposes right here. That um, this, you can encode universal quantum computation with a Hamiltonian of this form. And there's a very nice paper by uh, Daniel Ladar and Ari Mazel that also shows that if you, instead of having qubits, you imagine you have little fermions that are like hopping along these kinds of lines right here. And they have, they have two internal states. And you have two fermion interactions. So you actually have two, like three states per site. Then also you can encode quantum computation in this, in this Hamiltonian, both in its dynamics or in its ground state. And the way it works, by the way, if you think of these as being fermions, this, this little green string represents the positions of the fermions that are holding the qubits of your computation. You start with the string all the way over on the left, and then it takes a quantum walk, moving through the computation in this way. Whenever this hops from there, it does a quantum lot. From here to here, it does a quantum logic gate, just like in this Feynman picture. And it gradually, in a, in a, a quantum walk version, it starts over here, and then it propagates over there. And in the adiabatic version, you basically start it over here, and then you smear it out until it goes into the ground state of the system. And the system is computationally universal. So this is a Hamiltonian model of, um, of things that are universal for quantum computation. Let me just make an editorial comment here. This is not an, actually not an editorial comment. It's, it's a fact. Um, there are many, 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 many papers that talk about how um, you embed quantum computation using pairwise interactions. Um, uh, this paper with Barbara Terhall is the only, and, the, and me, is the only one that I know of that's actually of any physical use in terms of constructing such a system. And the reason is all of these other papers from a long time ago, and I, I myself am guilty of paper, writing papers of this sort as well, they all use higher order perturbative gadgets. But in the Feynman, see in the Feynman Hamiltonian, right, you actually have this thing that's hopping from one place to another. You have these two qubit operations. If this is a particle or a qubit that's moving from one place to another, these are four local terms in this Feynman Hamiltonian. To get four local terms from two local terms, you have to go to higher order and perturbation theory. But this means it will never work, right? Because to have the perturbation theory succeed, the actual size of these terms in your Hamiltonian will be very small. And you have to cancel out the higher order terms in perturbation theory to a very high degree of accuracy. And this is, you're just going to end, if you have to go to fourth order in perturbation theory to make this work, and you know, your fundamental time, uh, uh, frequency scales are on the gigahertz range, and then you go down to you know, 10 megahertz to go down to get into the per perturbative regime, and you go to fourth order, your actual terms that are trying to implement this in, in perturbation theory are on the order of, um, let's see, 10 to the minus 6. They're on the order of kilohertz. So if you look at any perturbative gadget, higher order perturbative gadget approach, you'll find that the energy scales are inappropriate for actually implementing it. However, this paper that we showed, you can actually implement everything uh, at lowest order in perturbation theory. It's fine. The energy scales that you get for hopping are just the energy scales that you have in the original Hamiltonian. That's just an advertisement for this work and a warning also because it's a warning because, you know, we're hearing about talks about people making non-stochastic terms in their Hamiltonian for quantum annealing. 
And you can say, ah, now we have non-sequastic terms. So this thing, you know, we know that this thing is universal for quantum computation. And so now it's going to do interesting stuff for us. Not so. You know, that's not necessarily true. Most of the proofs that non-sequastic terms help you, again, use these perturbative gadgets, you've got to set it up so the non-sequastic terms can actually do things for you. And I know from past HUC meetings that if you just do quantum annealing with non-sequastic terms in it, it often doesn't buy you, you know, the, whether it buys you something or not is an open question. Let me, let me put it that way. Okay. So uh, sorry about that. The, 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 uh, these are kind of editorial remarks here. But I think it's important. Uh, these are things that are important to remember here. So let me actually make, mention another version of uh, universal deep learning. Suppose we're going to have a time-dependent Hamiltonian. We have two Hamiltonians we're going to apply in sequence. One is just uh, sum of sigma x terms on all the qubits with the same strength. And the other is an icing-like term. So, but we, each time we apply it, we can have a different icing-like term. So first we do z1, then we do some rotation of each of qubits around the x-axis, then we do z2 with the different values for these gammas and omegas, then we actually do some rotation around the x-axis, then we do zn. This, um, by the way, if all these z's were the same, so if they didn't depend on l, this would just be the uh, uh, dynamics for the quantum approximate optimization algorithm, which I always have a really hard time remembering from its acronym. I believe that the folks at Google called us the Quinoa algorithm because it's easier to pronounce than QAOA. Also, many people call it the QAOA algorithm, which is kind of like calling it the El Camino Road or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, so this is an interesting Hamiltonian. But if, if I allow these Zs, the Z Hamiltonians to change at each time step, then I claim this is basically trivially computationally universal and has arbitrary fan out. So I can write models uh, going back to here. Uh, I, can write, I can write any gate model with arbitrary fan out into this Hamiltonian dynamical model here. So it encompasses both QAOA and it also is computationally universal. So all of these, um, all of these models are of the following form. Basically, I've got some kind of circuit or some kind of Hamiltonian. There are a bunch of weights, a vector of weights, which specify what terms are there in the, this dynamics. So here the terms are the gammas, the omegas at each time set, the t's and the tau's. Those are the weights here. Here the weights are the omegas, the lambdas, and the gammas. Here the weights are the, uh, the gate set that we are, we are supplying, plus you know which gates are in which places. So in all these cases, we have some set of weights. And we pop in some input psi, and we get uh, some unitary transformation psi at the output. And this unitary transformation is a function of these weights. Um, uh, it need not be unitary. We toss out a bunch of bits and things like that. But let's just restrict our attention to these unitary things for the moment. So now our question is, for all of these models, they're all universal for quantum computation. Can we adjust these weights, w, to obtain a unitary function of w that reproduces patterns in data? So uh, I've taken my kind of general hand-waving question from the uh, opening slide, and I've turned it into a specific question. You pick the architecture that you want, whatever architecture you have for, uh, uh, that allows you to construct you know, deep universal circuits. Um, I, I think actually my current favorite is, I mean, I'm, I'm, of course I'm fond of this one. Um, and this is also the one that's most appropriate for thinking in adiabatic terms. But this one I find is a very a particularly fine one because it, it uh, allows this, it includes QAOA as a, as a the quantum adiabat, sorry, quantum approximate optimization algorithm <laughs> as a, a special case. And it's computationally universal and it has arbitrary fan out. This seems like a nice version to me. But you can pick whichever one you want. So now can we, uh, can we adjust whatever version you pick? Can we adjust the weights to reproduce patterns in data? OK? So now this is a, a well-defined uh, mathematical question. And if you have a device that can implement this kind of stuff, it's a well-defined operational question, because you can now go ahead and start trying to do this. OK. So oh, is, are people OK? Does this like, uh, seem like a reasonable? Reasonable question to ask of a universal deep quantum learner. 
<laughs> I'm getting no feedback, so are people asleep? That I'd be worried, you know, like uh, as uh, you know, Eddie and I were saying earlier, okay, you close the window. We're all jet lagged. Who, or people came from other countries, and you close the windows. You turn down the lights. And now all you have to do is turn up the heat, and then everybody will just like go clunk. I, I mean, actually, I probably wouldn't, though. I once attended a talk where the speaker fell asleep in his own talk. Uh, he was a, an elderly and extremely brilliant physics professor, high energy physics professor, and. Um, during the question and answer session, somebody asked a very long question, and he fell asleep while, <laughs> while the question took place. And what was interesting is when the question was finished, he woke up and he answered it. <laughs> very brilliant answer. It was an amazing, I mean, that's a talent I would really love to have. How do you do that? Right? It's like some subconscious thing. OK, so let me first answer this question for uh, uh, the example that I gave before. So let's look at this case of quantum data. So let me ask a very specific question. We're given access to input-output pairs for this circuit. So for example, somebody, whoops, somebody, what happened? Oh, I think it was my problem with like this, yeah. So suppose that actually somebody sets these weights, doesn't tell us what they are, and we are allowed to sample input-output pairs for the circuit. So we don't know you. Can we actually find you with enough samples or approximate you? So um, I'm going to phrase this question as following. Given access to input-output pairs xj, phi j, for example, be in an oracle or something, they could be in, in memory, quantum access memory, or they could, be, they could actually be, I take a quantum state, I put it through some actual physical device and I look at the output state. So these could be actually experimental inputs and outputs. So this is actually not, um, you know, you don't need a big quantum random access memory for this to be true. We could actually ask, you know, we're trying to do process tomography and somebody says, oh, I put, I, I put in this state, here's a state I put in and here's the state I got out. Here's another state I put in, here's another state I got out. Here's another state I put in, here's another state I, I got out. Um, uh, that's something that you could just do. You could just look at the outputs of the system. So the problem is to find the U, we're going to try to adjust our Ws that maximizes this, uh, or sorry, minimizes, excuse me, this should be a minimizes, minimizes phi j minus U um, of W x j, right? So the sum of these j squared. That is, we want to find the U that does the best job of taking the input states and turning them into the output states. And the, uh, so we ask, can we do this? And the answer is yes, we can. Yes, we can do this. Um, there's actually quite explicit formulations for doing this um, uh, using quantum algorithms, explicit methods. There's a very lovely paper. I'm actually a co-author with Iman Marvian. That's the first author. And I'm allowed to say it's lovely because Iman had the idea and did all the work um, about giving, given these xj and phi j, if you, this is an actual unitary relation about constructing this u. And then I have a paper unpublished with Patrick Rebentrost um, and uh, several versions with Mark Wilda and other people um, uh, that shows uh, if I call L this matrix that says take the input state and turn it into the output state, and that's kind of colloquially what it says, it is this matrix, you can prove that the U that minimizes this quantity is actually L times the uh, inverse square root of L dagger L, and then you can actually implement this particular unitary transformation given copies of psi j and chi j using this process called density matrix exponentiation. So it's actually, it, given a small quantum computer and given the, these input-output pairs, you can learn this. But I didn't actually ask quite that. So this is learnable. Um, and by the way, if you, it, it's learnable in time that goes, it's logarithmic in the dimension of these states. And uh, it's your accuracy basically. So this, the, the time that it takes to actually do this, um, to do this reconstruction goes as log of the dimension of these states. Any classical version of this is of course going to be polynomial in the dimension of these states. So it's an exponential speed up over classical tomographic methods. But I actually asked, can I actually find this W? And here there's a remarkable result. Um, uh, this is quite remarkable I think. Suppose I actually want to find these, these Ws by gradient descent. And here I'm using this universal uh, method that has fan out and QAOA and stuff like that, where 
apply an icing Hamiltonian for a bit, rotate about x, applying icing Hamiltonian for a bit, rotate it about x. I'll call this u t of tau, and also it depends on the parameters, these omegas and the gammas that define the z Hamiltonian. So our goal is to adjust our weights to attain some desired target unitary. Um, now, it's not clear that gradient descent will get you there, right? You could easily start adjusting weights, get a certain way along the line. You're minimizing your, uh, your target function right there, and you could just get stuck. So stochastic gradient descent will not obviously get you there, but there's actually a remarkable theorem from quantum control theory by Herschel Rabbits from 2005, which says in the limit that this n gets large, there are no local minima to this problem, except for the global, global minimum. That is, if you have some target v, and you adjust these t's and tau's by, um, uh, uh, in, by looking, by trying to go you know, downhill in this space, you will eventually get to this target. It's quite an amazing result. Um, uh, this, by the way, I, I, I've been, I, I'm saying this because Hartmut is here. I was inspired to go look for theorems like this because there are a series of theorems in um, classical neural net theory. I mean, actually, why does deep learning work at all? Right? It actually is kind of crazy. You have, you know, you have some, some function that you're trying to minimize, like, the, um, uh, like for example, uh, the kolbach liebler distance between your projections for your data and the actual data. And you've got a whole bunch of weights. And you're going to adjust these weights, and you, you know you're going to try to minimize some. You're going to try to minimize some objective function. Now, and generically in this kind of thing, you have some funny rugged landscape in the weight space. That is this function that your objective function you're going to look at as some rugged landscape. Why should you actually, when you actually do something like stochastic gradient descent, why should you actually find an answer that works? This is actually very mysterious about just about classical machine learning. And the answer, actually, by the way, this is not something on for which there is an agreed upon answer. Um, but what, what you can actually show is that if the weight space is highly redundant, so that is the limit as the number of weights that you're adjusting gets very, very, very large, um, then typically uh, any local minimum, either there are no local minima, as in this quantum theorem, quantum control theorem, or the local minima have their, they are very, 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 very close to the global minimum. Um, there's a, a bunch of evidence for this. There's not been proved, it's been proved in certain contexts, like if your objective function is a Gaussian function in the weight space, then this is true. There's a bunch of other kinds of arguments. They're subject to many, 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 many different assumptions, which are, there's so many of them, and they're so well established in the field that you read papers, and the paper says, Okay, subject to assumption A3, 4 to 5, and B6 to 9, but getting rid of assumption C7, we can prove the following. But the paper doesn't even tell you what assumptions A4 to 9 are, or C7, or B6 to 12, because they've been used so many times that you're supposed to know this, which actually makes these papers, at least for me, rather hard to read. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so this is actually, this is an amazing result that rather generically in these machine learning problems and also in these quantum machine learning problems, that um, either there are no local minima or, or the local minima are just as good as the global minimum, and that means you can define things by gradient descent, except, and this is also something that, that Hartmut and I talked a lot about and uh, then following up on it. By the way, I, the other, one of the other things I was going to talk about, thinking of talking about is, showing how you can use quantum coherence and environmental interactions to get out of saddle points much, much, much faster in a quantum annealing process than a classical process, which is something Hartman asked me to do, and I've got some results on this. Um, so there are many, many, many saddle points here. So there are no local minima. You find many places where the gradient vanishes and you have to explore in the vicinity of the, of the saddle point to find a place where you can continue to go downhill. Um, and this, of course, is a big problem. This is a huge problem in classical deep learning for folks who look at classical deep learning. These saddle points are tough to escape from. Um, and it's also an issue in quantum machine learning, though, as I said, though I'm, I'm not going to justify it other than just saying it, um, when you have quantum walks 
environmentally assisted quantum walks for quantum annealing, then um, uh, you can escape from saddle points much better than you can in the classical version. Anyway, so, so this, is a, this is, I think, a remarkable result. And, and we're actually trying to take these results right now from the quantum version to try to do much stronger proofs of these classical machine learning versions that, that you know, don't require assumptions A, 6 through 9, D7 through 12, C22 to 23, um, but just uh, uh, involve some very simple assumptions about what kind of deep learning networks you have. OK. So, we, so when I said there are no results in this field, we actually have some very nice and, and kind of very general results. That is, that when we're trying to do this kind of problem, which is a very general kind of quantum problem, and we're given examples of the states that we're trying to match up, then there are quantum algorithms for small quantum computers that will do this effectively, efficiently, exponentially faster than any classical tomographic method would do. And then, moreover, if you actually try to find solutions via quantum annealing, at least in, in theory, you can actually, sorry, by stochastic gradient descent on the weight space, then at least in theory, you can find such solutions. OK. So now let's go on to, um, oh, and, and here is a nice, a, a particularly simple example of this. Um, for, let's not talk about quantum supremacy just yet, though I already disparaged quantum supremacy. And I will no doubt feel, feel compelled to disparage the name quantum supremacy again. But um, even though it's a very interesting actual physical question. So let's take one step of the quantum approximate optimization algorithm. So I start out in the state one, which is the, universal, the uh, uniform superposition of all logical states. I apply my Z Hamiltonian for one time step. I apply my X Hamiltonian for one time step with some unspecified or unknown T and tau when I look at the, the, the resulting state. So um, this actually is, there's a very lovely paper by Eddie Farhi and Aram Harrow that show that this actually, if you do measurements in the logical basis on this state that the resulting measurement statistics exhibit quantum supremacy. That is to say um, that uh, it's strongly believed that you cannot reproduce such statistics from any classical device that's equipped with a random number generator, which is called sampling. Uh, for some reason, I mean, it seems to be the, the, the opposite of sampling. It seems to be the degeneration of statistics as opposed to measuring and sampling from the statistics, but that it is called sampling. Now, let me just note, uh, and this is a trivial point, that suppose we are given copies of the state phi. Somebody hands them to us, and we're allowed to put it into our quantum computer. Then we can actually find this tau and this t simply by exhaustive brute force search. So we don't even have to worry about anything fancy like stochastic gradient descent. We just go through the whole, you know, the whole set of values. Since, since these things, both of these unitary transformations wrap around at a certain point, we just go through the whole set of values of t and tau. We just see what we, we find them. We compare it to phi. And eventually, we'll find these values that will get us to phi. So you know, we can find these. Now we have our weight vector has only two weights. There's t and there's tau. And we can find them. What, however, what about however, what happens if the data is classical? So suppose we're actually given samples of measurements of phi in the logical basis. So all we're allowed to do now is we're allowed to measure the state phi in the logical basis. Now, these statistics from the results of these measurements are the classical statistics that are promised to exhibit this quantum supremacy. That is, they cannot be generated via a classical computer with a random number generator. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, we're, we're cool. I'm on, I'm on, I'm on it. Anyway, you started me uh, in very un-Japanese fashion, three minutes late. So <laughs> but, uh, I will try to respect our sponsors and get us back on time. <laughs> um, maybe it's because you're not Japanese. Could that be why? Yeah. <laughs> Me neither. OK. So, um, so now, so this, we're given this promise um, from these nice results of Eddie and Aram that these statistics cannot be generated classically. And if we knew the right measurement to make, we could actually demonstrate this. 
But the problem is we don't know the right measurement to make. And could we find tau and t from these measurements of phi? It actually seems highly unlikely because in point of fact, as those guys, as Eddie and Aram show in their paper, one of the most salient features of the results of measuring this phi in the classical basis is that the probability for any particular sequences of zeros and ones is very, 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 very tiny. So as you measure and measure and measure, you're going to get, you know, one, 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 zero, 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 one, zero. That's the first measurement. The next time you get zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero. The next time you get something else, and it never repeats or doesn't repeat until you've made an exponentially large amount of measurements. And if you're just getting random looking stuff, um, you know, and that never repeats until after a very large amount of measurements, then it's essentially impossible to tell, um, uh, to, to tell just from sampling and looking at the statistics uh, whether it's possible to generate classically or not. So this is actually uh, the reason I have all these question marks and exclamation points after it. This is, I think, the big challenge um, for this field about quantum supremacy. Um, uh, Eddie and I had a nice conversation about this at breakfast where he expressed himself much more eloquently on exactly the same topic than I did myself now. Um, uh, so uh, uh, I, I invite you to ask him about this as well. But it's a big problem. I mean, what it would be really nice, right? And here's my summary, so you don't have to fret. So we know that universal deep quantum learning can effectively learn and reproduce patterns in quantum data, and is very effective in doing that. We can actually, we have algorithms for reproducing this, the, the patterns in quantum data. If we have quantum input-output pairs of states, we can do it via stochastic gradient descent via some kind of deep learning network, but we don't know if universal deep quantum learning can learn and reproduce patterns in classical data more efficiently than classical deep learning. And the reason is that for things like quantum supremacy, we, even though we're given assurances that you know, a classical computer can't generate this data, and presumably also, though this is not proved, can't recognize it, you know, that is can't classify it, we don't have any examples of, of dynamics where um, if we're just given samples from the classical, the outputs of this classical data that we know, you know, we, it could be pretty reproduced and recognized by a quantum computer, but we have no way of knowing if we can learn how to do that. And that, I would say, is the, the, the again, the $64,000 question about uh, deep, universal deep quantum learning or about quantum learning in general. Can we actually give something that demonstrably does better in analyzing classical data? And the answer is right now, no, we can't. We don't know about this. So, but you know, there's reason for optimism and here's the following reason. So classical deep learning was developed, you know, in the 1950s to 1980s, all this stuff, you know, dates back, like perceptron and things date back to Minsky and Papert and people in the 1950s and then Hopfield and, and um, Hinton in the 1980s and 1990s developed all this stuff about Boltzmann machines and, and deep networks and contrastive divergence, blah, 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 blah. Um, but it didn't work very well. I, I, when I was a postdoc at Caltech in 1988 to 1991, I would go and visit John Hopfield and talk with him. And this was just at the time when these early neural networks, you know, were doing fine at, you know, recognizing a little bit of handwriting sa samples and, uh, you know, memor giving memories of like three different memories. But they didn't do very well. And they had just kind of crapped out and they weren't doing any better. And I remember Hopfield saying at the time, he said, you know, I understand this isn't working well, but you know, if we had uh, computers that were a million times as powerful and we had a trillion times the data, or a million times a day that this would work, I swear. And that's basically what's going on, you know. We do have computers that are a million times as powerful, and we have not only a trillion times the data, we have 10 to the 12th times the data that we had back in those days. And when you train these computers with the giant weight sets that are highly, highly redundant, and we have these big data sets, then it works. And actually, I think both of these are important. We must have both big data sets to train them on. We also need to be able to build these computers that have highly redundant weight sets, because this, I think, is very important. My, in my understanding, reading the literature is that unless you have you know, a billion different weights in your neural network, so it's actually highly redundant, and you're actually, in some sense, overfitting the data, then local minimum will not be the same as the global minimum. So it's important that actually you have a million different weights or a billion different weights, because then these results kick in that it's going to work. Okay, so what does this say for quantum learners? Let's just build them. Adiabatic quantum learners, Hamiltonian quantum learners, and see what happens. 
And that's what people here are doing. We heard a lot of great talks this morning. We'll hear more this afternoon about how you build such devices. And I say, if you build it, they will come. So build these devices. We'll find out if these things work. And that's probably the only way we're going to find out if it works. Because I'm not, as a theorist, I'm not optimistic about some proof that we're going to, you know, be able to learn these, um, these patterns better than we can classically, any more than there was ever any proof that classical deep learning would lurk, work. The only proof that classical deep learning works is you build them, and it turns out it works. So thank you very much. Oh, I invite our next speaker maybe to get ready, so we have time for a quick question. If our next speaker get ready. Um, so you had this uh, formula you wrote down with um, like e to the t1 x1 and e to the t2 z2. So what did those x1 and z2 and so on um, stand for? Is that the same one each time, or? No, if it's the same one each time, then that's just QAOA. Uh -huh. But if it's a different, and QAOA is not known to be computationally universal, I don't know. It, it would be an interesting open question, I think, if it is. Um, but if you change the icing model each time, then uh, it's, it's straightforwardly it's straightforwardly computationally u universal. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and has arbitrary fan out. So that's, okay, what that, that's, what that, that, that's what that particular universal model is. More questions? What, did they turn up the heat in the room with something? <laughs> <coughs> so I, I didn't quite uh, understand what you were saying about the connectivity requirements. So you had, drew, drew first one that was all to all, and then you showed your work where yeah. it seemed like it was just nearest neighbor. Right. So, uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So the um, the Hamiltonian version of um, for for doing universal deep uh, universal quantum computation is actually only nearest neighbor, but it doesn't have all in all connectivity along each at each level. And of course, this is an issue for uh, uh, quantum annealers that people are building here. There's a big connectivity issue. And when you build a Boltzmann machine, a stack restricted Boltzmann machine, and program it, for example, into D-Wave, as Mohammed will tell you, then you know, since each, each of your qubits has only connected to, um, what is it, like uh, six others, right? So, so then, uh, then um, you, know, you can't have that full connectivity. Of course, it's still universal, right? Uh, six is ample for universal for making it universal. But. Okay, let's thank the speaker. Okay. Thank you.